How are we doing? I've, uh, I've experienced a little bit of, uh, of discontent with my uh, outfit choice today. I, I, I didn't know how I felt to, to preach in a, in a jersey. I thought that might be, you know, bordering on, on something bad. Um, at least Dalton went to TCU. Well, there is that. I, I, I uh, you can tell by if you if you don't know this is an Andy Dalton jersey who hasn't played for the Bengals in at least three years, uh, but uh, I I will take uh, donations to the Sean Get a Burrow uh, Foundation uh, after church today if you would like to uh, to give uh, feel free. Um, uh, Careful, you might end up with a Mahomes jersey. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. There's some things that we just we won't we we're not going to do. <laughs> not not willing to wear the uh, Patrick Mahomes jersey. Uh, Hey, uh, a little bit of grace though. We haven't made it to the Super Bowl in 34 years, so I mean, just be happy for me. Like, we should all be Bengals fans today. Um, we can we can agree that uh, that it shouldn't be the Rams, right? Go Rams! All right. I I tried. Uh, the the number two on on that front is that uh, I was told I had no choice in this matter because uh, Dustin said that this is what I had to do. So uh, he'll be my complaint department. So if you have any any complaints. See the guy with the crazy hair. All right. Uh, okay. Hey, if you're a first-time guest, uh, we are so happy to have you guys with us this week. Um, you have, have joined us in a, a time where we're kind of talking about what kind of church we are. We'd love to see you back for uh, a week or two, um, or three or four, or just forever. Uh, so uh, come and, and, and see what we're about. Come and, and, uh, and experience um, just being part of, of this, this part of the body of Christ, this, this family that we've, uh, we've grown here. Um, if this is not your first week, Welcome back. Good to see you again. Good to have another chance to, uh, to worship along with you. Um, all the kiddos, you should have your sermon sheet, your uh, sermon note sheet. If you don't already have that, um, we may have some still over there. There's a lot of folks here today, so may maybe they're all already all out. But um, you're listening for the word worship this morning. And so if you will keep track for me how many times I say the word worship, you can throw down a, a sticker, make a mark, uh, however you're going to do that. Um, and, uh, and you can tell me at the end how many times that... Uh, that I use the word worship, okay? Um, hey, we are in our fourth week of a, of a sermon series we're just calling Biblical Church, where we're talking about um, some of the characteristics of what it means to be a church based on the Bible, um, the church that we see just after the, uh, the death and the burial, the resurrection, and then the ascension of Jesus um, in the early portions of uh, the book of Acts, and, and then um, going on into the Apolline epistles, the, the kind of churches that we see there, and the church that, that they were called to be after uh, Jesus had, had left, and uh, these aren't um, every characteristic that you could ever think of, um, but these are a few, I think, uh, key characteristics of what it looks like to be a church based on what we see uh, in the pages of, of Scripture, and so we've, we started with uh, the foundation of the church, which is the Bible. Um, that if we want to know what the Bible look or the church looked like in the uh, in the in the first century, we got to go back to the pages uh, of Scripture and, and see what it looks like. And we need to found ourselves on the Bible to be a biblical church. Um, the second week we talked about leadership, um, what it looks like to uh, to to call men to to lead uh, a congregation, and uh, and the special uh, responsibility and and privilege that it is to to serve in that capacity. Um, we talked about uh, eldership a little bit that, that week. And then um, last week we talked about uh, some of the essentials of the faith. We talked about doctrine and just uh, the things that we unite around uh, when it comes to um, teaching. And so this week we're going to talk about worship. Um, worship and what that means as, as, a, as a biblical church. When we go back to the early stages of what we see in, in, uh, in the, the, the Bible, um, what does worship look like and what is it called to look like? Um, there has been... Uh, Plenty of, of ink spilled, um, keyboards clacked upon, or however, of, of uh, comparing um, sporting events to worship. Um, if you think about this, um, uh, tonight there's going to be a Super Bowl, right? And there's going to be this, this uh, giant crowd of people who are going to come into this, this stadium um, and they're going to they're going to shout and yell and cheer and and root for. They're they're dressed up in, in costumes and, and uh, team jerseys and they paint paint their faces and all of the things that people put into um, this effort that is uh, uh, cheering for um, the sport of, of football, right? Um, and, and I think that we can see something of an echo of of, of something of worship in uh, in that as we look at it. I'm not an anti-sports person at all. 
Um, just a little background on me. When I was growing up, every single time in middle school and high school, I had a, I had a, uh, uh, a study hall. I would, I would take that study hall, and we were allowed to go to the library during the study hall so that we could check out books, but I wouldn't check out books. I would go there and, and pull out the sporting news. Um, and, and so the sporting news was like a big uh, paper back in those days. Um, we had newspapers. And, uh, and I, would, I would look through the sporting news and I would, I would look at all of the, the, uh, the leaders in all of the different uh, categories in, in the NFL. And, and I, before fantasy football was a thing, I used to make, I used to make fantasy teams. And I would, I would put together all of the people who like, were the number one receiver, the number you know, one rusher, the, the defenses, and look at team stats. And, and I, I thought it was so fun to just go through and meticulously look at the statistics and, and, and all of the different things and know everything about um, the sport of football. Ever since I was like a fifth grader playing tackle football for the first time, um, football has been like the, the key of like watching sports. Like if I could watch anything in sports, football's it. Um, it, is, it is the number one passion for me of just like watching sports. Um, Ohio State, the Bengals, as bad as they've been forever, um, I, I, I love watching football. And so again, that's just a, a little bit of like I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not saying that that uh, being involved in sports I'm not saying that that having a passion for sports is a bad thing but I think that we can we can look at the way that people come around especially um, the Super Bowl and we see tens of thousands of people um, come into the stadium we see millions tens of millions of people um, watching it on on the television and and we see the way that people are enthralled by this moment where they come together. I think there's a picture in there, uh, a little bit of the way that, that, that we see worship, um, and, and we think about the way that, that worship will be when we're all called together in the kingdom of God. Um, when, when we're looking at the, the throngs of people who are there in heaven who have come to worship the one person who is worthy of all of our praise, who is worthy of all of our attention and our affection. And so my prayer this morning is, is that as we go through this information, as we go through this the study of God's word that, that I, I would just give you some taste of what that will look like, um, that, that you will have some connection with, with the God who is worthy of all of our praise. Um, and, and that through this, this, this time together, we will, we will get a picture of the glory of what heaven will look like when we come together in that final stage of, of worship around the one who is, is worthy of all of our uh, praise. When, when our souls find that, that ultimate satisfaction. And so, um, I just want to start out with, with a, a single uh, statement this morning. Um, and that statement is that uh, before we even study worship, um, the statement is that God has designed us to be satisfied in worshiping him. Um, the design of God in every single human being is that we would find satisfaction in worshiping him. Amen? Amen. Um, for, for those of you who are here today, and, and maybe that's not where, where you are, um, let me just tell you that God created you to find satisfaction in worshiping him. And, and, and we look for, for satisfaction in so many other ways. We look for it uh, in relationships, thinking that we'll find that, that man or that woman who will be the, the key to our lives and, and when we'll find satisfaction in being around um, that person. We, we look at, at work sometimes and we think about the way that we could um, find satisfaction in, in having a career or the finances or the wealth or the, the status or the, the success in that, that category that would, that would be this satisfaction for us. Uh, we, we look for it sometimes in, in sports or celebrities or a hundred different other ways that we live vicariously through others. And we think that, that, that by living through them, we'll find some sort of, of satisfaction. But the truth is, is that, that God designed us to find satisfaction in worshiping him. That, that true satisfaction will only be found as we come into alignment with what God has called us to be and, and worshiping him as, as he is due with our lives that he has given us and our energy that he has given us and the provision of, of being around the people that he has given us, that as we worship him in that, in that capacity, we will find satisfaction for our, our souls, that we find our satisfaction in worshiping God. And so if you have a Bible with you this morning, we just want to look at this, this subject of, of worship. We're going to look at, at John chapter 4. 
Um, if you don't have a Bible with you, um, there might be some in the uh, in the seats there in front of you, uh, sitting in, uh, underneath of them. Uh, you, you're free to, to, to use that today. If you don't have one at home, take that with you, and that's our gift to you. Um, we'd love to, ha uh, to have you have a, a piece of, of God's Word that, that you can uh, rely upon and, and look at and, and study to, to know who He is and, and how He's created you. Um, and so open up John chapter 4, John, uh, the fourth book in, in the Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Um, right there in the New Testament, it is a, a, a story of, of who Jesus is. It's a, a gospel account um, of his life and ministry um, here on earth. And so John chapter 4, we're just going to begin in verse 1, and I'm going to read through this, this story of an interaction between Jesus and, and a, a woman by a well. It says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact... Uh, it was not Jesus who was baptizing, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back at once to Galilee. Now he had gone through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well uh, was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, uh, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, uh, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How, how can you ask me for a drink? And then John gives us this parenthetical. He says, For Jews didn't associate with Samaritans. Uh, Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and, and would have been given uh, he, he would have given you living water sir the woman said you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep where can you get this living water are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself and also his sons and his livestock Jesus answered everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again but whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst Indeed, the water I give them will uh, become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I, uh, I won't get thirsty and have to come here and draw water. He told her, Go and call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say I have no husband. And the fact is, you have had now five husbands, and the man you... Uh, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. Uh, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, the time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For, there is the, uh, for, there, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and his worshipers must worship in Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. John is, is, uh, is recording this interaction between Jesus and this, this woman that he encounters at, at a, a well. Uh, and Jesus has, has come to her. And, uh, and this is a, a, a woman who um, has sought satisfaction in having a relationship with someone else. Um, she has over and over and over uh, gone to the well, um, if you will, of, of thinking that, that she'll be satisfied in, in marriage. And, and, and man after man after man has let her down. Um, man after man after man has, has not been what it was that she was um, searching for. Um, and, and so she has is left her in this state where now she is, um, she is kind of an outcast. Um, she's coming in the, the hottest part of the day um, to this, this well to draw water. Um, she's not all that comfortable being around the rest of the citizens of that, that town, or, or maybe they have made her feel uncomfortable. And so now she comes to this well in the middle of the day, in the hottest part, when no one else is there, because she will be left alone. 
Um, and, and Jesus comes to her and he asks her for a drink and immediately she's, she's a little defensive of, of the entire situation. She asks him, why is it that you're asking me for a drink, right? Um, Jews and Samaritans, we don't get along, so why are you asking me um, for, for a drink? And, and Jesus, um, he, he wants to give her something that she wants so desperately, the this, this satisfaction that she has sought. Um, in her life so often. And so he tells her, listen, I, I could give you water that never dries up. Water that, that you don't have to come here to this well to get it. I could give you a living water that would well up inside of you to eternal life. And her answer there is, is perfect. She says, that's the answer that I want. I don't want to come back to this well. I don't want to have to be out here. Um, where, where is this water? How would I get it? This, this Samaritan woman, she's, she's longed for uh, an escape. From, from coming to this, this well in the middle of the day and the, the prying eyes of everyone around her. And, and this seems like a, a really good um, excuse to her, a, a really good way to escape that, that situation. And so um, Jesus, though, instead of, instead of just giving her water, he's going to engage her now in a discussion on the subject of worship, on what it looks like to, to worship God. And, and you see, the Samaritans, they worshiped on a mountain there called uh, Gerizim. It was, it was a, a corrupt form of Judaism. And so what happened was all of the, the Jewish people who were in the northern kingdom were taken out of there um, into captivity in Babylon. Um, almost all of them. Some of them were, were left behind. And so the ones that were left behind, um, they, they intermingled with all of the other people around them. Um, they, they took on in, uh, in wives that were from um, these different pagan religions. And because of that, they ended up uh, incorporating those pagan religions into their worship. And, and before it was done, they had a, a, a totally different product. They had a new people, uh, Samaritans, and they had a new religion, Samaritanism, um, and, and they, they practiced all of the, the things that the, the religions that these people had come from, and they just kind of incorporated those things into uh, Judaism. And, and much has been said about um, the divide between Jew and Samaritan in the American church, um, generally on racial lines. Um, not really what was going on there. It was more on, on purity of, of the religion, right? It was on fidelity of the faith. That was where the line really was, although there was certainly some of the other stuff um, that went along with it. Uh, and so Jesus, he, he takes her concern about where to worship, and, and he turns it into who and how to worship, right? So he takes where you worship. She's, she's talking about, is it here on, on Gerizim or is it there in Jerusalem? Where is it that, that is the right place to worship? Is it fine that we worship here? And he says, listen, that, that's not the conversation that we're going to have. Rather than that, I'm going to tell you who you worship. I'm going to tell you how you worship. Um, that, that God himself is spirit and the way that you worship him is in spirit and in truth. That God has designed us to be satisfied in worshiping, worshiping him. And so how we worship him and who we are worshiping is incredibly important if, if the satisfaction is going to be found in worshiping him and, and how he wants us to worship him, right? And, and so that's where Jesus takes her. And, and, and I think that it's very easy for us in our own um, ignorance and arrogance in the same way that the Samaritans have to incorporate everything that we see around us and make those things so important to what worship is or should be about when in fact it's mostly about who it is that we worship and how it is that he has called us to worship him. And so let's just pause for a moment before we get into anything else and talk about who it is that we worship. Who it is that, that we worship. We gather together this morning in worship of the God of all of the universe. The, the God who, who has created the cosmos by a single word. And through that word, he has, he has made everything that we see so that, that he reigns from eternity past to eternity future, that, that he breathes out stars and they become stars. And he breathes out planets and they become planets. And he breathes out people and they become human beings. That, that God himself created not just the cosmos, but he created you. Um, in Psalm 139, it says that, that you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Each and every person here was designed by God so that we would find satisfaction in him. The God who sustains the, the entire cosmos, the God who, who holds it all together in the palm of his hand, that's who we've come to worship this morning. 
just, just take that in and think about that for, for just a moment. How, how grand this God that, that we are called to worship is. Because I think it's really natural for us to come in here with all the things going on in our lives and to go through the motions. Um, to, to come through the doors and, and greet all the people. Um, to, to sing a couple songs. To listen to somebody speak. And, and to never once incline our hearts toward the God that we are called to worship. That's where we are this morning. We are called to worship God. And so as we sing these songs and as we listen to these words and as we do all of the things that surround this worship, just take a moment and recognize who it is that we have come to worship, the God of all of creation. That's who we worship. Now let's look at how Jesus says we are called to worship, how we should worship. He says we should worship him in, in, in the spirit and in truth, with, with our, our hearts and with our heads, right? That, that all of our being should be called into this, this state of, of worshiping God. And so let's start with the spirit. Um, there is a, a supernatural element to, to worship that I think gets lost on the American church so often. Um, so often it's, it's it completely a spiritual um, event in, in which um, we come to, to be wowed with, with whatever's going on. Uh, and and for, for many in the American church, it becomes this, this uh, experience of like, uh, man, is the show going to be as good this week as it was last week? Because last week it was, it was you know, intense or, you know, <laughs> something was going on. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the spirit was moving. Um, or it becomes uh, completely devoid of the supernatural and it becomes this intellectual thing where we come and we learn the lesson and we, you know, go through the point by point by point and, and it, you know, everything is, fits in in, in, our, our, in our minds. Um, but, but what Jesus is talking about here is something that... that Neither of those two things really encapsulate. He's talking about a supernatural experience in which we come and God the Spirit enlivens us and awakens our spirit so that, so that he stirs us to celebrate him, right? And in and, and, and the way that, that God the Spirit comes and he, he sits on this, this room and he, he enlivens each and every one of us to come and to, to worship him. It's the supernatural working of God within our midst as we come and we gather together for this purpose, to worship him. He empowers us to transform, to change into the people that he wants us and needs us to be. He matures us into the likeness of Christ through these moments of, of worshiping him. And so we assemble together, not out of obligation, right? Not, not because we have to, but because we get to. Um, these, are, these are moments that each and every one of us all week long should long for when we come back together with the saints and we tell them about all the ways that, that God has, has moved in our lives throughout the week and the people that we have shared his story with and the way that we have, have served those around us and, and the way that, that, that we come to these moments in time where we worship him together saying, thank you, Lord, for, for being my God. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you have, have fashioned me with the people around me so that I can glorify you. Thank you so much, Lord. And not just with this moment, though this moment is, is most definitely one of the times that we worship, but with our entire lives. Uh, Paul writes it this way in, in Romans 12, 1. He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And so Paul is telling us that, that true and proper worship is our entire lives. Like, you know what the problem with, with a living sacrifice is, right? Um, the problem with a living sacrifice is it doesn't sit there, right? It, it gets off the altar and it walks off. Um, and he's telling us we need to be a living sacrifice every single day. You deny yourself and you take up your cross and you follow Jesus. Every single day you have to put yourself back on the altar of, of God's grace. And you have to, in view of God's mercy, live as a living sacrifice to God, all of us for all of him. And so each and every week we come to this moment in service, right, where we, we remember what it is that Christ has done for us in view of God's mercy we, we focus in on and we think about what it is that Jesus did for us, that he gave his life in our place for our sins to make us belong to God. And so I just want to invite up um, Lance, who's going to uh, lead us into that moment of, uh, of, of gathering around the Lord's table this morning. 
morning again. Hey, it's working, Jeremy. <clears throat> Although we come to the table each week, we should never allow ourselves to consider it a habit or a ritual. Jesus specifically said that when we come together, we should do this in remembrance of him. Taking communion is not something we should take lightly. It, this is a time to reflect on our Lord and Savior, the undeserved gift of salvation he gave us, and our own individual relationships with God. This morning I want to talk a little bit about Peter. Peter was a common man, a fisherman by trade, who was called specifically by Jesus to be a disciple. Matthew chapter 4 verses 18 through 20 says, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. That's a pretty good indication of faith to me. But like us, Peter was not perfect. His faith was not infallible. John chapter 18, verses 15 through 18 says, Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went, went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. Peter went on that night to deny Jesus twice more. It seems sometimes his faith wavered, especially when he felt threatened. Now let's go back to Matthew. This account, for me, really describes Peter, and it makes him relatable. Matthew 14, 25 through 31. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus said to them immediately, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? So how are we all like Peter? And I can't answer specifically for everyone, but this is something we can all think about and pray about. Peter was just a common working man. I'm just a common working man. To the world, there's nothing special about either of us. However, to Jesus, Peter and myself, and uh, each of you are very special and called in your own way to do his work. Obviously in different ways, but we all have a calling, a way to serve, and a way to share the good news. But are we as willing as Peter was to drop everything immediately and follow Jesus wherever he takes us? Peter also denied Jesus, three times in fact. I can't say that I've blatantly denied Jesus or my Christianity in the same way Peter did. However, at times in my life I've found myself behaving in a way that would not indicate to anyone that I was a Christian. I've had opportunities to share Jesus and ignored them. I didn't say that I wasn't a Christian, but that's how I lived in those moments. That's not much different than Peter saying he didn't know Jesus, because I acted that way. And I've had doubts about Jesus. Peter's words when Jesus was walking on the lake are profound to me. They show doubt and faith all at the same time. There were 11 other disciples on that boat that remained hunkered down. Instead of having faith that Jesus would protect them, they gave in to fear. Peter, on the other hand, had the courage to say, Jesus, is that really you? Stood up in the storm. And that shows some doubt. But when Jesus said, yes, it's me, Peter tested him, but he still stepped out of the boat. That shows incredible courage. Despite Peter's shortcomings, he went on to tell many about Jesus. And despite being just a common working man, Jesus had great plans for Peter, and he used him. Jesus has great plans for you and I as well, and if we'll follow him, he'll sure use us. Peter denied Jesus three times, but Jesus knew that was going to happen. And he still used Peter for his work. Peter had faith and doubt at the same time. And I think sometimes we do too. Let's take a quiet moment of silence here and examine our individual callings. And to go ahead and forgive ourselves of the things that Jesus already forgave us of so that we can move forward. And to talk to him about any doubts we may have so he can reach out his hand and pull us back up out of the water. And then as he commanded, we'll take communion in remembrance of him. Let's pray. Oh, 
Father God, I thank you today for all the blessings you've given me and my family and, and my church family and those that I love. Father, I thank you that despite my shortcomings and, and me just being a common working man with many faults and many doubts, that you're always there to pull me out of the water, that you're, you, you, you've forgiven me of so much forgiveness that I didn't deserve, paid a debt that was all mine. Father, I thank you for that today. And I just pray that those of us that are about to enter in communion with you understand the relevance of, of what this bread and this juice represents, that it's your body broken for us, your blood shed for us, so that we don't have to. Father, we love you and we thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Bible teaches us that, that all of our lives are to be a sign of worship, right? They, all, of, all of what we are and all of what we do is to be an act of worship toward um, the God who has, has given us that, that life and that time and that energy. Um, and yet the Bible does call us to gather together corporately. Um, for the purpose of, of hearing the word of God and, and singing psalms and, and hymns and spiritual songs, um, praying together to the Lord and praying for one another, um, caring for each other. Um, we need that, that, that worship to be saturated in, in the spirit and in truth. And so um, let's talk about the truth for a moment, God's truth, the, the, the biblical revelation of of God's word. Jesus tells the Samaritan women um, as he's talking to her, he says, you guys worship what you don't know, but but we, the, the Jewish people, we, we worship what we do know, right? And so there's, there's a, this distinction that he's giving her and what, what is truth here, right? That, that it, in order to, to worship God as, as he desires, in order to worship him as, as he would want us to, we need to know him and the revelation of who he is and how he would have us go about worshiping him. That, that we need to understand that the, the Holy Spirit, again, alivens our hearts to, to the word of God through the reading of scripture, through the study of, of what that word looks like. We, we want to know the God that we worship. We want to know how he calls us to live because of that worship um, for him. The, the more that we see him, the more that we will savor him. Um, the more that we see him in the pages of scripture, the more that we study his word, the more in depth we know him and we appreciate him and, and we draw in our affections toward him. Um, we want to know the God that, that we worship. And that's why one of the, the greatest priorities we have when we come in worship in these times and moments of worship is to, to study the word of God, to, to look at what it actually says as we're doing this morning to see how it is that we're called into this life of, of, of worship toward him. Um, the, the, the priorities that we find as we look at, at this, this study of worship this morning is, is the spirit and truth. Right, that we worship him in the spirit and in truth. But that's not really the priority that we get in worship if we just look to the culture um, for, for where worship is to be found, right? Um, in fact, in the, in the American church, um, generally the things that, that draw people in, the things that, that people look for as they're searching out a church, they look for really good music, like um, really engaging speaking, like great kids programs, right? Uh, delicious coffee, <laughs> um, like, those are the things that, that seem to be super important in the American church. And let me just say that if those things are important to you this morning, I hope the coffee is delicious. 
Um, <laughs> because, I mean, this is it, right? Um, but, but we're here and we're worshiping in something much more important than, than those other things. We're worshiping in spirit and in truth. Um, I, I have a couple of, of, uh, of friends um, that I want to share with you this morning. Two of my uh, best friends in ministry, um, a guy named uh, first Tyler Russell. Um, these two knew nothing of the American experience of what church looked like until they came to America because they were both in the mission field elsewhere. Um, and, and Tyler Russell, he grew up as a, as a missionary's kid in Panama, um, where he met with God's people under uh, aluminum carports, you know, like, like you would park your car under um, in an apartment complex. And, and they, they put tables there, and they came together, and they worshipped the, the, the God of the universe in spirit and in truth. They, they prayed, and they sang, and they read scripture, and they studied together, and, and, and they loved each other in Spanish, right? Because it's in Panama. Um, and, and my friend Tresor, he comes every single, um, a, a, once every three summers, he'll come here and he, he teaches for our, our camp. And so for the entire month, he's our camp missionary um, every fourth year. Um, and Tresor, he came from, from Congo um, to here. Uh, the rest of the year when he's not here with us or the rest of the years that he's not here with us, um, he runs a, a school and a church and in the Congo, and, and out of four, you know, uh, concrete walls, um, they they uh, study all week long to find out what it is that, that God wants from us as as His people. Um, uh, on Sundays, they come together and they sing songs and 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 psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and they pray together and they read the Word of God and they study it and they see what it is that God has called them to be. But they do it in French because it's the Congo, right? All over the world today, this morning, right now, all over the world, people are gathering in, in Mexican restaurants and, and, and in huge complexes, right? All, all of the different things that we think about when we think about coming together with God's church, but what is at the middle of that is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit coming and inspiring us to be the people that God has called us to be, enlivening our hearts to hear the word of God and to apply it to our lives so that we might be transformed and live that out to everyone around us, to, to be a servant to, to all of the people that we are called to serve. And, and over and over and over, what we, what we find as we search through the pages of scripture is something so different than, than the discontent and the disconnection that we find in, in huge stadiums of people um, who are, are, are called together in, in concert halls and shopping malls, right? What, what we see in the pages of scripture is people who are dedicated to God, who, who want nothing more than to, to be called his people and to be about his purpose. And so this, this week, as I was um, preparing for this morning's sermon, um, I thought about the Super Bowl a lot. I mean, more than I probably ever have in years past, um, for obvious reasons, right? Um, I, I was thinking about the Super Bowl, though, and, 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 and it, it occurred to me, why, why do I care about this Super Bowl more than last year's Super Bowl? Because last year, I didn't even watch it. <laughs> uh, the year before that, I remember being at the Saunders house, and we played dominoes the entire time, because... I couldn't have cared less really about it. I mean, for, for some it was really important and, and super sad um, <laughs> because the Chiefs whooped them. Um, <laughs> for some it was a rejoicing situation because the Chiefs whooped them. Um, <laughs> but what, what has me enthralled in it this year? Because it means something to me, right? The, the, the more that we are engaged the more that it means. And I don't think there's anything different here when we look at, at, at the story of what it means to worship God. The more that we are engaged in Him, the more that we are engaged in His work, the more that we are engaged in what it means to, to live a life of sacrifice to Him, the, the more we will see the mission of the church lived out in our lives. When we get worship right, it leads us directly into a life on mission. 
we, we, we see this as, as we continue through the, the, the story in, in John chapter 4. If you read the end of that story, this woman who, who wanted nothing to do with all of the people around her, who would rather come in the middle of the day so that she'd have to uh, deal, encounter anyone in that, that town. Um, she, she comes in the hottest part of the day when no one else is around. She doesn't want to be around anybody. But the first thing she does when she finds out about who Jesus is and she engages in the God of creation speaking into her life and she sees her life on mission, she runs into the town. And she can't wait to tell everyone that she sees about the one who knew everything about her. All of a sudden, her testimony becomes the, the exact thing she's using to bring others out to know Jesus and, and we see revival in, the, in, in this town of Sychar and in the, the region of Samaria, Samarita, uh, Samaria, there you go, because of Jesus' interaction with this woman sitting at the well. And, and I think it's the same for each and every one of us. As we leave this place today, as we go out into this parking lot, we're going to see people going in and out of Dollar General. We're going to see people driving up and down um, Business 54 who have no thoughts toward Jesus Christ the farthest thing from their thoughts. Um, we, we, we live and we eat and we play and we go to school and work and around people every single day who have no thoughts toward Jesus Christ. And yet, God has, has positioned us in that spot where we can be the way that they come to know who it is that God is. Where they might come and find satisfaction for their souls in worship of him because he's designed them to find satisfaction in worshiping him. And, and, and when we come to that spot where, where we realize who it is that we've come to worship and we realize how it is that he's called us into a life of, of worship toward him, our true and proper worship, all of a sudden our lives have a whole lot of meaning and so do theirs. So let's be the conduit between the God who has come and given us a water that will never leave us thirsty. A water that wells up to eternal life. Let us offer them a drink of the satisfying cup of Jesus Christ. Father, as we come to you this morning, I'm realizing who it is that you are what it means that, that we come in this place and, and worship you this morning. Father, we just ask you to open our, our hearts, open our minds to what it is that you have set us out to do. Father, that as your people, people who are called by your name, Christians, little Christs, Father, that we might be made into matureness and the likeness of Christ so that we can be the conduit between you and others. Father, help us to, to realize this in our lives so that we can show others in theirs. Father, as we come here this morning worshiping you, Lord, I just ask that if there is anyone here who doesn't know the saving work of Jesus Christ, who hasn't accepted his death in their place for their sins in order to be made, renewed, redeemed, reconciled with you this would be the day of salvation Father as we come into this moment of, of reflection and response Lord we just ask you to to renew our hearts and, and instill in our minds the mission that you have given us to go and to live lives in worship of you we love you and we thank you for Jesus it's in his name that we pray Amen Will you stand with me? We're going to have that, that moment of reflection and response. And if you're here today and you don't know anything of Jesus, um, if you're here and you just need to know the next step in following Jesus, I would love to talk to you about that. I want to stand over by the door today, uh, and I would love to talk to you about that. Um, if you're here today and you just need to, to live in, in obedience to what God has called you to, um, this can be a day where you respond in that way. And we live out what it means to live a life in obedience to God and worship for who he is, how he has made us, and the mission that he has given us. Let's sing.